Yeah. No, we are. And then just because um, we ended right after we finished going over the quality of the raw data, um, and I didn't really have a chance to ask you guys questions or to let you ask me questions. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is okay with what we went up to so far um, in the Jupyter notebook. So going through assessing the quality of the FASTQ file. Is there anyone that wants to see something again and wants me to explain something again? Wait. Um, what does dot slur mean? So uh, I, I add that <laughs> myself. So I actually, uh, when I create those scripts, so going all the way back up here. So this script here that I made for you guys to be able to submit um, <clears throat> your fast QC job in the to the to the job scheduler. Um, the job scheduler that San Jose State uses is called SLURM. SLURM is an acronym for something I can't remember right now. I don't know if someone wants to look it up and put it in the chat. Um, so anytime I write a script and it it's intended to be used to submit that job to a SLURM job scheduler, meaning that it has these sbatch commands at the beginning, uh, which is what's communicated to the job scheduler so that the job scheduler knows what resources to, to ask for. Uh, Phil said, or Dr. Heller says it's a simple Linux utility for resource management is what SLURM stands for. Um, and so anytime I'm writing a script um, that's intended to be submitted to the SLURM job scheduler, I put the extension .slurm just so that I know that it's supposed to be, um, a, that, it's a, that it's a SLURM script. So that's why I add dot slurm at the end. Uh, so usually uh, if I'm making a script that's intended to be run on the local machine, I'll call it a shell script and end it in dot sh. Uh, so. No problem. Any other questions from the stuff that we covered before lunch? Cool, let's trim our data. Okay, um, so now that we checked the quality, as you guys all mentioned uh, before you took off for lunch, that uh, we should indeed uh, trim these data, right? We wanna get rid of some of those adapter sequence and remove any uh, low quality. And so uh, we're gonna do that, as I mentioned in the lecture, with a tool called TrimGlore. And TrimGlore is actually a wrapper uh, around another tool called CutAdapt. So it, it uses the CutAdapt software to, to do the trimming. And of course, we're going to be filtering the raw reads to remove any sequence adapters that were detected because those, of course, were artificially added. Um, and we're also going to remove any low quality base calls. And then after that's complete, we're going to remove any reads that become too short after trimming. And so you guys kind of answered this in the lecture, but just as a reminder, why would we want to do this before aligning to a reference genome? You can type your answers in the chat. What's the point of, of trimming and getting rid of the stuff that we added artificially and getting rid of those low quality base calls? Yep, exactly. So Aon says to be able to more accurately map and to remove noise, Kevin, yep. <clears throat> Make it easy to align more confident, yep. Uh, Zinru, that's right. Yeah, so, so all of this is we want to get rid of anything that we added artificially. We want to get rid of anything that we're not confident in, um, and that'll just improve our mapping quality when we go on to the next step. And so we're going to be trimming, of course, uh, both of our reads, our forward and our reverse read. Um, and we're going to be doing this just for one sample in this command. However, I've trimmed it for, for all the samples, so we'll check out the quality of all samples um, after we trim and this is another job that uh, requires too many compute resources for all of us to be submitting to the head node. And so instead, again, similar to what I did with the FASTQC 
uh, scripts, I made a Slurm script and inside that Slurm script, it's set up very similar to what we went over for the fast QC. So I keep track of the start time, the end time. I tell it the resources needed uh, to run the job. For the sbatch commands, I also print out the version of the tool. So I have all those same things within the Slurm script, except the difference is the actual command that I'm running. So uh, this time the command in that Slurm script looks exactly like this. And so these are some of the options that we went over in the lecture. Um, if you guys wanna review those again, so I have the definitions of all the parameters or options we use for all of our tools. Uh, and so one option that uh, I don't think I went over in the lecture is this gzip option. So for this tool, we have to tell it that the input data that we're giving it, that those FASTQ files that we're giving it are actually compressed. And we have to tell it how it's compressed. So those are compressed with a, a tool called gzip. And so it needs to know that. And then these are all the other stuff that we already went over. So we tell it the coding of the ASCII characters, which represents the quality of each base call. We tell it that this is uh, Illumina, that this was generated on an Illumina platform. So it knows to look for Illumina adapters. And then we indicate where we want the outputs to be. And we also tell it that this is indeed paired end data. So that way it makes sure that if either the forward or a uh, a reverse read becomes too short, both the forward and the reverse for that read are removed. So that way we maintain that every single molecule that we sequenced has both a forward and, uh, and a reverse read. And then lastly, as a positional argument here, uh, meaning that it comes at the end of the command, we give it the, the FASTQ files. And this is in the format where you wanna put your forward read first and your reverse read second. So it's gonna assume that whatever FASTQ file you give it to first is gonna be the forward read and whatever FASTQ file you give it to second is gonna be the reverse read, separated by space. And so our input data here is giving it those raw FASTQ files. And then what we're gonna get is an output is we're gonna get back FASTQ files but we're gonna get back the trimmed version of those FASTQ files. And then we're also gonna get back a trimming report. So we're gonna get back some information um, about what happened during this trimming process. Let me actually turn off my video. Okay. Um, and so, again, um, because this requires too much compute resources for all of us to be running at the same time on the head node, we can go ahead and submit our uh, Slurm script. So go ahead and run that Slurm script. Um, and while that is running, um, since we are all have submitted it to the, the job scheduler, is there anyone who does not have, who, is there anyone whose screen doesn't look like mine? It's a little bigger. Does anyone not have the submitted batch job and then it gives you a job number? Okay, so I'll assume everyone's job has been submitted to the Slurm job scheduler. And while those are running, um, like I said, I have a set of data that I already processed so we can kind of continue on as we're waiting for our jobs to run. And so let's take a look at what that trimming report um, is going to look like. So if you guys want to run this command, so this is just opening up um, the trimming report of the flight sample, the rep one of the flight sample, and this is for the forward read. So you guys can go ahead and play that. And so I do have some, some questions for you. Uh, as we're taking a look at this. So as you can see here, um, it gives us some information. So it tells us what the input file it, it used and it tells some information about the mode. This is another tool that actually prints out the version um, that it's using. And then remember, Trim Galore is a wrapper for Cutadapt. So it also tells us which version of Cutadapt it's using. Uh, this tells you uh, how many cores this is uh, for the, the compute system, so we're just running this on one core. Uh, it tells us what the what the cutoff is, so it's basically repeating the options that we told it to, so we can kind of confirm that those options are. And then you see here that it actually tells us the adapter sequence, the Illumina adapter sequence. Um, and then it has uh, error rates, so these we didn't specify, so we're going with the default of these, um, and some of these other ones are, are defaults too, so adapter overlap, stuff like that. And all of these options for all the tools, I have a link to the tools themselves. 
So if you guys are interested in any more information about any of these tools, please click on the link and, and read more. And then after reading, if you still have questions, of course, bring them to me. I have a verbiage question. What does wrapper mean? It means it contains something else. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so a wrapper is just a code or a program built around another program to provide more functionality um, or maybe to uh, enable it to do something that the program itself can't ordinarily do. I don't know if any actual programmers <laughs> out there have a, have a better description of wrapper. Please unmute your mic. Okay, so I'll assume that, that my explanation was sufficient for a wrapper. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> and then um, it, this is also telling us by default that the output um, FASTQ file is going to be compressed as well, which is good, right? Because we want to kind of minimize the uh, amount of storage space that we're taking up with these large files. And Cutadab is written in Python. Um, so it tells us kind of that and what version of Python it's Cutadep is being run with. And then we have just uh, some additional parameters here. So these are just some of the options that are the default options. There's another way to tell us uh, some more of the options here. This is basically the standard output of Cutadept. So because the Trimgalore is a wrapper, these are basically all the standard outputs from Trimgalore. And then it also gives us the standard outputs from Cutadept. Uh, and then kind of the most interesting part of this uh, trim report, the, the part that, that I look to uh, when I'm trying to do any troubleshooting is this summary. And so this summary will give us some information. So I just want you guys to take a look at the summary. And again, we're, we're looking at the forward read right now only. So how many forward reads were processed? Yeah, so Diksha said 28 or 68,373,507, yes. So that's how many reads uh, were processed. You can find that information right here. So total reads processed gives it to us nice and easy. Um, let's see what else we want to look at here. So how many reads, or I guess I should say, what percentage of reads contained adapters in the forward? Yeah, 32.8%. So it's nice because um, this summary will tell us uh, the total number of reads with adapters and also break it down in terms of a percentage of the total number of reads. And again, uh, we're looking just at the, the forward strand right now. And so after adapters were trimmed uh, from the forward and reverse reads, uh, were any, uh, any of these reads removed? Yeah, it's in room. No. So, so no reads uh, were removed here. You could see that the reads written are the same as the reads that were processed. And the reason for that is because we're not, we're just um, cutting off reads based on quality. And so uh, right now this, this step, because it's paired end, is not looking for the, the final size of the read. It's just as long as so much wasn't chopped off that, that all the reads were gone um, or that the full read was gone, you'll, you'll get everything back. So unless like you had a really bad quality read to where everything was chopped away and you're left with nothing, um, you'll get everything back here. And then the assessment of what reads need to be dropped because they're too short will come later. And we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. We also, so this is a read breakdown uh, of the forward analysis. We also have a base pair breakdown. And so uh, just kind of taking a look at this, um, I have a question here of how many base pairs were removed due to poor quality in the forward reads? You guys can go ahead and type your answers in the chat. Yeah, yeah, so 0.1% so or um, the total number of reads that were trimmed due to quality is going to be uh, just over 5 million. So uh, out of all the, or sorry, I should say um, total number of base pairs, not total number of reads. So of all the reads, the total number of base pairs that were chopped off because their quality was poor is just over 5 million base pairs. 
And then um, you'll see what the total written base pairs are here. And so what percentage of base pairs uh, passed filter? 98%, yeah. Yeah, 98.6 to be exact, right. Um, and so I, I keep saying base pairs, I should say bases uh, because of course we're just looking at the forward reads so we're only looking at we have one, one set of the bases. So this is yeah about 98.6% of the bases were recovered. And then this kind of um, breaks it down a little bit further. And this is telling us the, again, the sequence, uh, the length of it, uh, how, how many times it was trimmed. And it kind of tells you uh, all the way down, just some more information about the read itself as it was going through and doing the trimming, the position of the read length, and kind of um, some more information just uh, about the trimming process itself. I don't really look too much into that. Of course, there's 150. Why is that? Uh, why doesn't it add up to 100%? So you're saying, why doesn't this and this add up to 100%? Um, so remember, this, this is just looking at the quality trimmed. So um, these are base pairs that were removed due to quality. So that's not also including the base pairs that were associated as adapters. And so it doesn't really give us a breakdown of the number of base pairs that were removed because of adapters, but that is included in the, in the total count. So that's why, yeah. Uh, good question. And so this, again, just gives us information about uh, each position, each base pair position in your read length. And so we should see 150. Why is that? Why are we seeing 150 positions being looked at in this trimming report? Yeah, so it's, our, it's our max read length. So um, the number you should see here should match your, your max read length. Uh, and again, uh, it just gives you another summary of the total sequence uh, processed. And so that matches, it's, it's the same information that was given to you in the summary up top here, kind of starts and ends with that. Okay, uh, so that was for the forward read. Now let's take a look at what the trimming report looks like for the reverse read. Insert size was 100 or 150, yeah. Yeah, so uh, because it was 100 or 150, it's gonna look at all base pairs up to the, the longest read. So that's why you're seeing it go all the way up to 150, even though really the majority of the reads just have 100, but it does wanna make sure it assesses the quality of even the reads that, that are longer than that. So that's why you see it go up to 150. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at what that same trimming report looks like, but for our reverse reads. You guys can go ahead and run this code block here. And we're going to see the, the same exact set of information, right? Because the same tools were used, the same uh, settings, flags were used for the tools. And so uh, this looks exactly the same as the forward read. And so let's take a look at the summary, though, and let's, let's kind of see how that's different or if it's different. Uh, so first, how many how many reads were processed for the reverse strand? Yeah. So is this number the same or different? So so that number is here. So total reads processed again is that sixty eight million three hundred seventy three thousand five hundred seven. Uh, yeah. So it's the same as our forward read. Should it be? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, we want to make sure, yeah, since they're paired, absolutely. Um, so those should definitely be the same uh, all the time. So next, let's take a look at the adapters that were detected. So how many, um, or what's the percent of reads with adapters for the reverse side? 35.4, yeah. For sure. So is this is this the same or is it different than the, the number of reads that were detected with adapters in the forward FASCII file? Yeah, it's a bit more. Um, how could that be?
doesn't it have to adapt for being like being the reverse read because there's sometimes that it gets uh jumbled up i i forget exactly what you said happens to it but sometimes in the reverse it gets jumbled up or something yeah so let's go back to lecture and take a look at that so we have here Uh, so this here is representing our forward read, right? And so remember, the forward and the reverse read are being read on the same insert. And so in this example, what it's showing is that the insert here um, is the same. Or it's the, so the number of reads in the forward direction covers the whole insert, and we have complete overlap with the reverse read, as you see here. So you see how both read one covers the whole insert and read two covers the whole insert in this example? That's not always the case, right? Because um, usually, and if you're you're making your libraries appropriately, you would want to see that this insert region is going to be larger than either read one or read two covers alone, right? So we would uh, in paired end one fifty. What we want to see is uh, roughly a two hundred fifty base pair insert, and so read one is going to be reading um, in this direction here up until the number of cycles, so 150 cycles. And then read two is gonna be starting on this end. I know it's kind of reversed here because that's how the, the sequencing happens, but keep uh, to keep you straight with which end you're looking at. So here we're sequencing from the red end. And then over here we're sequencing from the green end, right? So from the opposite end. So if you have this, this insert, right? And it's gonna be actually in reality, usually longer than either just the, the forward read or the reverse read can cover but that's not always the case. It can be shorter as well. And so what'll happen is as it's reading in one direction, it could be reading into your adapters here. And then as you're, you're reading in the opposite direction in uh, this way. So um, we could be seeing uh, differences uh, in there. And also uh, I should point out is when we're looking at read one, the forward read, if we have a single index, uh, did we include that index in the adapter sequence that we were detecting to remove? Could you say that again, please? So as we're, we're sequencing read one, right, we're sequencing into here and if this insert is going to be shorter than the number of cycles that we're sequencing. We're going to start to sequence into, into this adapter region, right? And so we know that this adapter, the, the priming region of this adapter and the region of this adapter that's attached to the flow cell is always going to be the same for uh, the Illumina kit that you're working with. But what part's going to be different? One is going to have an index and the other is not. Right. So if you're doing single index, this is going to have an index and the other one is not. And so when you're using your universal sequences uh, to remove adapters, when you're looking at your forward read, you're not going to start getting into the, the end of that adapter until after you get past your index and your index isn't included as part of the universal adapter embedded into the trim galore um, system. And so it won't start identifying uh, adapters until it's in here, in this region. Because remember, it cuts from this, this side. And so with your read two, as you're going in the reverse direction, what you'll see here is that you don't have an index. So uh, these samples I'm pretty sure were not dual, dual index, they were single index. And so, um, what happens is you don't have your index on that side, so it'll start identifying that adapter region sooner. So you probably have more adapter uh, in your in your reverse read than in your forward read, and so you'll likely see those um, more adapters detected in your reverse read for single indexed libraries. That makes sense somewhat. Awesome. Okay, 
Um, so we do see more adapters here. Um, and then again, how many reads? Uh, quick clarification question. For paired reads, can we use single index? Yes, you can. I was under the impression that paired would use two index. Um, I, I always go with two, two index for paired reads, um, but you absolutely, for paired end reads, you have the option of just indexing uh, on one end. So you can do single index for paired end reads. But I, of course, recommend doing two, and that's our gene lab standard. So these we actually outsourced, so we did not um, make these libraries. Uh, we gave them to Davis, and, and I'm pretty sure they did single index uh, for it, which is why we're seeing these differences. But yeah, you can you can you do have the option in paired end of doing single index or paired or dual index, I should say. Okay, um, how many reads past filter? For the reverse, all of them, some of them, none of them. Yeah, all of them, hundred percent. Yep. So again, um, all these reads, and again, this is just looking at the, the adapter. So after they were trimmed to remove the adapter sequence or the adapter bases, um, they still had all of their reads recovered. And so then the, the tool went into trimming based on quality. And so how many, um, you could say either the whole number or the percent, but how many base pairs were removed due to poor quality in the reverse reads? 0.3%, yeah. 0.3% total number 18,564,191 bases. Uh, yes, so in, yeah, you made the point, AON, that this is a little bit more uh, than the forward read. Why do you think? Try to reflect back on the, the quality, the fast QC report that we saw comparing forward and reverse reads. Yeah, the forward read had slightly better quality there at the end of the read. And that's where it starts the trimming from. So it starts the trimming from the three prime end of the read. Um, and so as we saw in that quality report, our reverse reads had slightly worse quality at the end of the read, so it's not, um, it's expected, uh, I should say, that that we're seeing more base pair or more bases removed due to quality in the reverse than we did in the forward. Um, and so after removing bases that were identified as adapters and removing bases that were removed because of poor quality, what percentage of bases were we left with? Ninety-eight point four percent. Yeah, for sure. I just I have an answer key here, and I realize that it's wrong. Okay. Um. So, did the forward or reverse reads have better quality? Uh, so, this is another way we can look is looking at the trimming report. I know we kind of beat this over the head but the, the reverse reads have worse quality than the forward reads. And then, so what you'll notice here after the summary, so we have again the total number of sequences analyzed, um, but this time, or sorry, we have the total number of sequences processed at the end, and again, that should match the number that we already saw here. But now we also see at the very end of the trimming report some additional information um, after the paired end trimming report that we didn't see with the forward trimming report. So uh, this first piece of information here indicates the total number of sequence that was analyzed for the paired length validation. And so what TrimGlore or CutAdapt does is if you tell it that it's paired, it makes sure that it has the same number of forward and reverse reads. So this is uh, confirming that and letting you know what the total number of paired reads is. So of course this should match the number of forward read and the number of reverse reads. And so then after it's gone through and done adapter and quality trimming for the forward read and the reverse read, that's when it starts deciding which read pair should be removed due to length. Why does it wait until after both the forward and the reverse read has been quality trimmed?
Right, because if one needs to be removed, the pair needs to be removed, Aylin said. Rashi says higher confidence. Yeah, it's it's uh, that's that's another way of, of saying it, right? That we wanna we wanna make sure that we maintain the same number of forward and reverse reads. So for every molecule that's sequenced, we want to have a sequence in the forward direction and we want to have a sequence in the reverse direction. So after quality trimming and removing adapters, if either the forward or the reverse read is below our cutoff of 20 base pairs, we have to remove both the forward and the reverse read for that molecule. And so were there any uh, pairs that were removed because they they didn't meet our cutoff, and if so, how many were removed? Yeah, yeah. So I see a couple answers from from Zin, Zinru and Veronica. We see it. Uh, Forty six thousand seven hundred thirty four reads were removed. Read pairs were removed. And that makes up about 0.07% of the total number of reads. So we didn't really uh, remove all that many reads after trimming, which is nice. Um, so we kept quite a bit. Okay, uh, we kind of answered all these questions as we went uh, throughout. And when I post this uh, on the, uh, when I post this in the Google Drive, I'll make sure to include the, the answer key with, with all these answers. So you guys have them written down, but we did go over every single one of them. Okay. We have trimmed our data. Is the index piece trimmed before mapping? No. Um, so the index piece is actually pulled out and put into the read header. Uh, so let's go back up to the read. Uh, so when you take a look at this read header here, uh, and sorry, that should be, there should be a space there, but it has to do with the size of my window. Okay. Um, so in these four lines, so in the read header here, uh, again, this first part is just going to be information about the flow cell and the location of the cluster that this read was generated on. And then we have this one indicating that this is a forward read we're looking at. And then kind of the last part of this read header is the index. So indeed, uh, as anticipated, these are single index reads. And so um, because they're, they're single index reads, this, this read during the second uh, read, actually, technically, of the Illumina sequencing is going to be reading that index. And so that index, when it generates the FASTQ files, is then put in the read header. And then actually the tool uh, that we use to create the FASTQ files, so sometimes it's, it's called uh, BCL to FASTQ, and sometimes it's embedded within the instrument, depending on the instrument you have. Sometimes you run it afterwards with the base call files. But you actually give it a sample map, and you tell it which index belongs to which sample. So when it spits out these FASTQ files, it'll actually spit out um, the, the FASTQ files with the sample name because you gave it a map to tell it uh, which index belongs to which sample. Good question. And then, um, actually, I kind of lied to you. So <laughs> I said, no, that we don't trim it. We do trim it. Um, I, I just wanted to say that it's not lost. Um, so that it is incorporated into the read header. But of course, um, as I just mentioned, if we're sequencing that first read here, we could sequence into the, the index. And so um, as you're cutting here, you're going to be cutting this adapter region, the part that's ligated to the flow cell. Oops, let me make this bigger. So you're going to be kind of part that's attached to the flow cell, and unless that a base pair in that index is the same as a base pair that's also included in uh, this adapter region, uh, if it is the same, it'll get cut because it'll think that it's an adapter. Um, if it isn't the same, then it'll be kept on there actually. So, so that's a good point because again, that that's not that index is not embedded within those universal adapters associated with the trimming. Is that clear? Do I confuse you more? (laughs) 
Yeah. So, so uh, remember, so read one is going to go and read all the way through, right? And so as you're removing the adapters, if it finds uh, this adapter sequence, it's going to remove it. And you could set the stringency of how many base pairs need to match the adapter sequence to get removed. And so we actually use a really stringent um, cutoff of, I think it's just like one base pair. And so if any one base pair matches a base pair in the adapter sequence, we get rid of it. And so um, depending on what base pair is in that index, and of course it's going to be different for different samples, uh, it may or may not get removed. So not guaranteed, but it could. Um, and then after that first read is done, the next read that happens in the sequencing, it actually primes this gray priming area again, and it just reads the index. And so that's the read that's incorporated into the, uh, the name of the read. Does that make more sense or less sense? <laughs> What's still tripping you up? You can unmute your mic. I think I just need to think about it for a bit. Mm, yeah, let me think about it for a bit. Okay, I highly recommend Thanks. watching that Illumina sequencing video again too. So understanding the sequencing and what information is collected in the, in the different reads um, really helps. So yeah, uh, after taking another look at that video, if you're still not getting it, uh, let me know and uh, we'll we'll talk about it a little more. Okay. So now that we have our trim data, any other questions about trimming uh, before we take a look at the quality? Okay, let's take a look at the quality. Um, so I'm not going to go over this in detail. It's literally the same exact command that we ran uh, with the raw reads, except this time we're telling it to uh, do the analysis on the trimmed reads. So again, same thing. We're going to be submitting a slurm script, except this slurm script, the only difference from the raw reads is that you'll notice now that we are trimming um, or we're uh, analyzing the trimmed reads. So I add this extension called trimmed. Uh, to the end of the files, so that way I know that these are the trimmed version uh, of the reads. And so we can go ahead and submit our slurm job. Is there anyone whose job was not successfully submitted? Is anyone not seeing submitted batch job? Okay, um, so while that's running, uh, we don't have to wait. So we can take a look at the standard out. Uh, this is going to look very similar, well, identical really, except for the FASTQ file used to the standard output that we saw uh, for the raw data, except this one, now we're seeing that uh, we're looking at the quality of the forward trimmed read for the sample and also at the quality of the reverse trimmed read for the sample. So again, the standard output from FASTQC, you're going to it's going to show you and tell you that it started the analysis, and then it's going to give you updates every 5% uh, until it's complete. And then it'll start the analysis for the reverse trimmed read, and then same thing, give you an update every 5% until it's complete. And then because of those extra stuff that I add in the script, you'll see like uh, how long it took. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is when I am making sure that everything went correctly, I will look for the analysis complete for each read in the standard output files just to make sure it finished successfully. Um, so rather than taking a look at the individual fast QC reports like we did with our raw, now that we have this nice nifty tool of multi QC to be able to compile the, the, the fast QC reports from all of our trimmed samples, um, we're going to go ahead and run that, and then we're just going to look at the, the multi-QC file for the trimming. So, and then this one, again, it doesn't require all that many compute resources, so we're all going to run this um, in real time. So, it's, again, it's the same command, except this time that flag to indicate the prefix named, rather than it saying raw here, I have trimmed, just so that I know when I get this report back that it's telling me information from the trimmed, um, the trimmed read data. 
And then again, our output, we're going to put it now instead of in the, the raw read folder. Now this is in the uh, pre-processed data folder, again, within the FastQC reports, and then the trimmed multi-QC report, which is just the compilation of the FastQC reports from each sample. And we end with our input data, which is the directory containing all of our trimmed FastQC reports. And again, I, I generated uh, FastQC reports for the trim data for all samples so that way we can go ahead and do this together. So you guys can go ahead and run that. Is there anyone who has not completed yet? Okay, awesome. Um, so again, uh, we're seeing the same standard output that we saw last time. Differences is where it's looking for the files. So it's gonna look for where I have that kind of primary set of process data stored for those FastQC reports. How many reports did it find? Uh, 24, is that what we were expecting? Yes, no, no, yes, yes. Yeah, so we're expecting 24 reports. Again, a forward and reverse read from each one of our 12 samples. And so now that that is complete, um, our, our standard outputs, we're gonna get that folder containing all the information used to generate those pretty uh, graphs in the HTML report. And so those are our two sets of output data. And of course, our input data was our trimmed fast QC uh, reports for each sample. And so, um, I have linked here again, just a description of the plots and you know how MultiQC puts those cutoff parameters um, in there. So if you guys wanna read more about that, um, you can go ahead and click, click the link here. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at this MultiQC report and then we'll, we'll answer some questions. So again, we wanna import the HTML, uh, the Python HTML library. So go ahead and run that code block. And then once that's complete, you can go ahead and run the code block to view the multi-QC report. Um, and you should be able to scroll um, right, right and left. If it's too small or too big, uh, you can also change the sizes up here uh, and rerun, rerun your block. Do we need to import? Yeah, we do have to import it each time before we use it. I mean, really you shouldn't for one session, it should always be loaded. Um, but when Lauren and I were, were practicing this, uh, we noticed that sometimes it wouldn't uh, print out the HTML report. And so if we run it every time before we look at an HTML report, it seemed to fix that problem. So we just uh, put in that command before each one. Okay, so I want you guys to take a look at these statistics. I'm gonna make oops, my screen a little bit smaller just so we can see everything on one. It's too much on one screen. So again, uh, if you're not seeing all of your samples at once, go ahead and uh, hit that arrow at the bottom and it'll show you the rest of your samples. And let's see. And now we are going to go ahead and look at the multi-QC report and answer some questions. So taking a look at the number of reads that we have left for, for each sample after trimming. So if you guys can recall with our raw data, we noticed that there were the most reads in our rep one of our ground control samples, and there was the least amount of reads in rep two of our flight uh, group samples. And so I'm just curious if that's still the case. And if so, what are the total number of reads now for, for both the, those two samples? So first uh, type in the chat is ground control rep one. Does that still have the most reads of all samples? Yes, it does. Yeah, I see a bunch of guys right in 85.6. Yep, so ground control rep one, you can see that right here it has 85.6 million reads. Um, what about for flight rep two? Is that still the smallest number of reads? And if so, how many reads are there? Yeah, still the smallest and it has 65.2 million reads. So I guess let's first start with ground control rep one. So does this have more or less reads than the, the raw 
that's Q file for that sample. So for ground control rep one, after trimming, do we have more or less or the same number of reads? You guys could scroll back up and look at the multi-QC report for the raw data. Yeah, as in there, there's less. So before trimming, we had 85.7, and then, yeah, so just barely less. Um, but of course, these are written in millions of reads, so we only see it to the resolution of the 100,000 uh, place. So uh, yeah, so it could, so it's, it's a little misleading, but um, definitely we see it less. And then what about our flight rep two uh, sample? Does that, does that look like it has more or less or the same number of reads after trimming? Yeah, so it looks the same as before based on the multi-QC report, but again, just keep in mind that we're at the 100,000th read place is the highest resolution that we're seeing for this multi-QC report, because we, so we could have seen something less than 100,000 reads be trimmed off, and that wouldn't be reflected in the numbers shown there. Uh, let's go ahead and scroll down, take a look at the quality. Uh, so again, you can, you can toggle back and forth between number of reads and percentages. This is looking at unique reads and duplicate reads, again, uh, with the caveat of everything that we talked about with how, how this tool detects duplicate reads. Uh, looking at the quality scores here, um, is the trim quality data better, worse, the same? What do you guys think? <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, when you're in the con in the context of you know tens of millions of reads, a hundred thousand reads is is fairly negligible, um, and I think that that's pretty much why why it does that rounding. Uh, so yeah, you could say that. Yeah, so Zinru is saying better. Kevin's saying better specifically at the end. Yeah, so um, interesting, right? Because remember, when it was assessing quality, it essentially looks starting at the end, so it removed base pairs from the end and um, it removed base pairs from the end until it reached a base pair that was of high enough quality to keep. And so you'll, you'll see that a nice little tail here at the end with the higher quality, but the cutoff was 20, a Q of 20. So as long as it was over 20, it was kept. So yeah, better quality for sure. Uh, I don't think... Did I show this yet? But I do want to. Oh no, we did. Total number of reads. Um, so next, let's take a look at. We well, guys take a look at at all these things. So again, we see you no know, nice quality here. Um, this kind of looking at the breakdown of the ATCs and Gs. We're of course still going to see that that high GC content spike. Uh, we didn't cut off based on ends. Uh, so you can do that. That is an option you could do is you could remove uh, and trim for ends. Uh, but since you're, you usually, you always uh, trim from the three prime end. So you kind of go through and trimming. So if you wanted to, if you had ends at the beginning of your sequence, you would need to trim from the five prime end. And there is an option to do that. We don't do that because usually if there is any ends in our data, the percentage is just so low. Um, that it doesn't really affect mapping at all. So uh, we don't do that. Does it never look at the quality? Um, it will not jump to a middle of a read to remove a base pair. Why do you think that is? So it only trims from the three prime end. It doesn't kind of hop around and, and trim in the middle. Not a base pair of full read. Yeah, so um, as it's going through the base pair positions and checking the quality, 
Um, so basically, it'll check the quality of the base pair right at the end of the read. If that doesn't meet the quality standard, it'll chop it off, and then it'll look at the next base pair. If that doesn't meet the quality cutoff, it'll chop it off, move to the next one. And it kind of keeps doing that until it finds um, a base pair that does meet the, the quality threshold, and then it'll stop trimming. So if like a whole bunch of reads at the end are really bad quality, it'll keep chopping them off. Uh, for until it gets to a base pair that has a good quality. So is there no way to look at the read as a whole and get rid of it if the overall quality is bad? So maybe the ends are good, but in the center it's zeros or some or really bad. Um, can you tell it if the average quality is bad, get rid of the whole read instead of individual bases? <laughs> Pretty sure you can do that. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head what option that is, but I'm pretty sure that that is an option and we use the default. <laughs> so I don't know exactly off the top of my head what that is. I don't know, Lauren, do you know? No, I actually don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure there's there's a setting for quality, for, total, for looking at the total quality of all base pairs. Um, but we use the default setting for that. But good question. I'll take a look at the documents during our next uh, break and, and get back to you. Uh, okay, so next question, adapters. So this one uh, was kind of updated with a, a recent version of MultiQC, which has kind of been driving uh, Jonathan nuts because he's been really parsing through these MultiQC files. And so what actually happens here uh, now for, for this version of MultiQC, which wasn't the case for previous versions, is uh, as it's compiling the, the MultiQC or the FastQC reports, if no samples contain adapters, rather than it graphing you a flat line, it'll just give you this notification that no samples were found with any adapter contamination greater than 0.1%. Um, so this, this in fact, I'm going to give an answer to one of the questions, but this in fact does indicate that we don't have adapters anymore. So it doesn't graph it because it just gives you a statement saying, hey, there's no adapters. Uh, this isn't even worth graphing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show, uh, I can't remember if it's in the main stats. Yeah, no. So I wanted to look at, I didn't realize it's on here, is the, oh yeah, we have a graph of it. Um, Take a look at the read length. Sequence length, here we go, sequence length distribution. So how did the sequence length distribution change? You guys notice any changes? I know it's kind of hard to see from this graph, but um, indeed you'll notice how there's some area under the curve here. Uh, yeah, so there's more shorter sequences. Um, so we do have now a range of, of lengths of sequences. And then, so, so now that we've taken a look at the quality of our trim data, do you think we're ready to align the reads to the reference genome now? Yeah, let's align some reads. Uh, before we do that, uh, we are going to hop to a lecture so I could talk to you guys about alignment. But I wanted to assess uh, where everyone is because I know we just had a lunch break. Is there anyone who needs like a five minute break right now? And also, is there any more questions about what we just covered in the Jupyter Notebook? Uh, Felix, go ahead. Yeah, if you scroll up to the GC per fast QC per sequence GC content, mm -hmm. what's the difference between the yellow and the red? Because it looks like the second peak is in different positions. 
Yeah, so um, the yellow and the red actually, uh, as I kind of mentioned, multi-QC, when it interprets the fast QC data, uh, it has these, these cutoffs. Uh, and so it'll give you like warnings or it'll tell you that your samples failed their cutoffs. And so, but their cutoffs aren't necessarily specific for RNA sequencing data. They're just for sequencing data in general, because you could run fast QC on any sequencing data, not just RNA seq data. So I don't really pay much attention to to their to their cutoffs um, in particular. But if you want to read more about them, uh, I do have the link up here. So if you click here, um, you'll have an example and a description of what all of these plots are and what their uh, the cutoffs are. But regarding these these peaks here, so that's what that's what the difference in colors are. So the yellow is indicating a warning based on those cutoffs for fast QC data in the multi QC report, and the red is indicating a quote unquote failed sample for that category based on the cutoffs in the, the fast Q for multi QC. Um, why you're seeing these two peaks is actually um, a great question. And it seems like we have contamination and it seems like the type of contamination we have in the, the forward read here is a uh, might be consistent in all samples and the type of contamination we have in the reverse read um, might be the same in all samples. And it, it looks like that type of contamination has a higher percent GC content uh, when you're looking at the forward read than when you're looking at the reverse read. So what, what that contamination is exactly, I don't know. Um, so we would have to do some analysis and probably align to different genomes, right? Because if this is contamination that isn't within the reference genome that we're going to align to, we won't know what it is because that those reads won't align um, if it has too much of that. But we can kind of, these might be uh, overrepresented sequences. So as you guys saw, it'll print out over, if you go to the individual FASTQC report, it'll tell you what the, so that's for the duplication levels. Uh, if you guys remember in the individual FASTQC report, it'll actually tell you what those overrepresented sequences are. So you could do a blast search on them and see if maybe that's one of those overrepresented sequences is causing this, this contamination, these peaks. Um, it could be, it could be PHI-X. Um, actually, it wouldn't be PHI-X at this point because PHI-X doesn't have a index on it, so it wouldn't have been allocated to a sample. It could be ribosomal RNA, and so that we might be able to tell in our reference because our reference genome should contain ribosomal RNA. Uh, yeah, good point. Probably not the answer you were looking for, kind of a non-answer. I just thought it was curious that some samples had, I, I mean, they're all being processed in the same cell. So it was strange that one would have one type or some samples would have one type and the other samples have another type. It's interesting because it's the same molecule, right? Being sequenced in the forward and the reverse direction. And so um, what must be happening is maybe there's some overlap of that forward in the reverse read of this contamination area. And it just so happens that when you're sequencing in the forward direction, the part of that contamination that you're covering has less GC content than when you're sequencing the, in the reverse direction. It might, so strike that, reverse it. Um, so we see that the, the forward reads have more GC content. So it just might be if there's a contamination somewhere in your insert, or if you're if you're looking at maybe you have some reads that are ribosomal RNA, so they have highly repetitive regions in ribosomal RNA. So if the molecule that you sequenced is ribosomal RNA, I know that these were supposed to be uh, ribodepleted, but whenever you do ribodepletion, for anyone that's done library prep will tell you, and um, you take a look at these samples, that that doesn't necessarily mean that you remove all the ribosomal RNA and actually re-report that. Um, in our sample tables, I believe, it's an assay table. Yeah, I think it's an assay table. So if you go to that assay table, I don't know why it's not on here. Hmm. Oh, good to know. 
So sorry that it's not on here, but for most of our RNA sequencing process data, I do look to see uh, what percentage of the reads uh, map to ribosomal RNA. Uh, unfortunately, that data isn't included in here. I do have that data stored on my computer for this data set, so I'll pull it up during the break. Uh, we can take a look at that. So that, that would be uh, my best guess for looking at this GC content. So if we have a molecule in the sample, so if the sample, if not all the ribosomal RNA was removed and uh, there are parts of ribosomal RNA that have really highly repetitive sequences, some of those repetitive sequences being Gs and Cs, and so if some of the reads that we've sequenced actually were derived from ribosomal RNA, and if they were derived from ribosomal RNA that has high GC content, um, what you see is that when you sequence that in the forward and the reverse direction, that read is going to have high GC content. And what this tells me, the fact that there's a difference between the forward G percent GC and the reverse percent GC, that means that that insert um, was longer than the length of the sequence. So it was, so for the 100 base pair reads or for the 150, it was probably bigger than 150. So the insert was likely ribosomal RNA. It was likely larger than 150 base pairs. So that way when you're sequencing that in the forward direction, um, you'll have a certain percentage of GC covered by that forward read. And then when you're sequencing in the reverse direction, you're gonna be sequencing parts of that insert that you didn't get to with your forward read. And so that's why you're seeing differences in the percent GC content between your forward and your reverse reads, as you see here. Um, and yeah, my, my guess would be that it's probably ribosomal contamination and we're seeing it in all samples. Does that answer your question? Oh, found the ribosomal contamination on the gene lab page. Where'd you find it, Jonathan? Uh, assay table. Uh, do you okay, it was in the to it? That's a uh, DNA methylation. So oh, the assay oh, table oh, includes yeah, all people. of them. I think I would know how to use my own repository. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for some data sets, we have multiple omics type within the same data set. So this one happens to contain DNA methylation as well as transcription information. So um, I was looking at the DNA methylation assay information. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. Oh, I was all disappointed. <laughs> I'm like, that data should be there. Um, so for the transcription profiling, this is looking at the technology type. Now we see the RNA sequencing data is being represented here. And we could um, look at our columns and close this and reopen it now. So we can look at our columns and I'll, I'm just gonna kind of simplify this and select just the sample name. And then we should see Parameter RNA, RNA contamination. So parameter value RNA contamination. And so as you can see here, um, I have a breakdown of the RNA contamination in each sample. And you'll notice that every single sample has some percentage of the reads that contain RNA contamination. And it looks like the smallest percent is like almost 9%. So 9% to I think what the max is like almost 12 and a half. So these samples range from nine and a half to 12 and a half percent of those reads are ribosomal RNA. So I, I assume that that's what we're looking at um, in those high GC peaks that we see. Good question. Uh, hopefully I answered it eventually. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that sounds like a pretty good hypothesis. Do you have uh, like the table that you just showed with forward and reverse, like can we see it would that show up in that data if you had different levels of RNA contamination in forward and reverse? Um, so it, it's looking at the amount. Uh, so when I do the ribosomal contamination, I tell the tool, so I actually use HTStream to do this, um, and I tell the tool um, that it's paired end sequencing. So uh, similarly to whenever we do anything with paired end sequencing, it's looking at information from both the forward and reverse. So it's actually taking both the forward and reverse reads and seeing how and if it maps to the, the ribosomal uh, reference that I provide. So the reference of what ribosomal RNA sequences look like in this case in mouse. Um, so you won't have a breakdown of like the, the sequence. So, so what we could do here actually is we could pull out the 
ribosomal region that both the forward and the reverse reads are mapping to. And then we could take that ribosomal um, read information and we could look at it and assess the percent GC content in the forward and the reverse read for each sample and see if it matches what we're seeing in this FASTQC report. And then uh, that'll tell us if our hypothesis is right or not. Um, and actually, I'm glad you bring this up because this is another project for um, some of you summer, summer interns is that right now we just report the percent of ribosomal contamination. Uh, we don't actually remove it in silico, so we don't remove it on the computer. Um, there have been some discussions from our AWG members saying that maybe that's something we might want to start doing. And so we want to, before we go ahead and implement something like that, we really want to do an assessment to see if it really changes the quality of our mapping or the quality of our differential expression uh, that we get at the end if we remove the, the ribosomal contamination, any, re any remaining ribosomal contamination in silico beforehand. So uh, some of you guys who are doing internships, this is another one of the projects um, that you could be working on. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you, Felix. And maybe we could do just that too. Uh, for those of you working on, that are gonna decide to work on that project, maybe we could do exactly what you said and we can align these. So I use a mapping. I'm actually gonna get into the difference between mapping and alignment shortly in the, the next lecture section. Um, but we actually do mapping here, so it's not straight alignment, but it's 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 pretty accurate. Um, mapping or alignment takes longer than mapping, um, and so uh, I do mapping to make it quick. And I did do an analysis on a couple of data sets to see what the similarities are if I do full blown alignment versus mapping. And they're pretty close, um, and so that that's another thing that we could test is we could do full blown alignment, and that's where we can actually pull out the sequences that are aligned and see what that GC content is to see if that hypothesis is right. See, it's an RNA seek fun. It's just a big puzzle. Uh, any other questions about trimming or trimming quality uh, before we hop into the lecture? Does anybody want or need a five minute quick break before we dive into the lecture on alignment? No, everyone's good to go. Okay, our next set break is at three. Um, this is another kind of dense material. Um, so as we're going through it, if you guys kind of want to break or want to step away before three, just uh, shoot a message in the chat and, and we can always do that. I want to make sure you guys are fresh and able to take in all this, all this information. Okay, so let's take a look at where we are in our pipeline. Um, okay. So, so far we have looked at our raw reads, we've assessed the quality of our raw reads, determined that we should indeed trim them. So we went ahead and trimmed them with Trim Galore, which utilizes Cut Adapt. And then we assessed the quality of our trim data using FastQC and compiled all of our FastQC reports using MultiQC. I took a look at that and I think we're all ready to, to start mapping this stuff. And so this is a step we're on here is mapping. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, what mapping or alignment means. Okay, so it's just telling us, reminding us that we have millions of short sequences. So how do we start to figure out where they all came from? Lucky for us, we are doing science at a good time because the human genome as well as the genomes of several model organisms have been discovered. And these reference genomes are available to all of us in public databases, which means that we have a place to start looking. Um, we have a map to try to figure out where these short sequences came from. Uh, I do want to take the time to point out right now that the original human genome sequence uh, build, we actually don't know who the, that information came from, who that DNA came from. There were several volunteers and there were more volunteers than samples that were used to put together the first build of the human genome and actually a couple of subsequent builds after that. 
And so people volunteered, they uh, donated their blood, and then a subset of those volunteers' blood were selected at random to build the genome. So not even the people that volunteered know if any of their genomic material is actually used in the build. However, that is to say, there was only you know a handful of volunteers. And so the human genome reference by no means covers the diversity of our human species. Um, and so we are currently working as a community to change that through projects like the Thousand Genomes Project, which is looking to sequence uh, a thousand human genomes uh, in the very near future. I actually haven't checked in a while how far they are um, in doing that, but. So that's just something to keep in mind as we're using these uh, reference databases. So we have all these short little reads represented here by these little short dashes, right? And these reads could have come from anywhere uh, from the DNA that was used to make the RNA that we sequenced, right? So if we're looking at the reference genome, they could have came from uh, coding, re coding exons, they could have came from non-coding exons, they could have came from intronic regions. And then of course we have this issue of some reads um, that could have, uh, that could span splice junctions, which we'll get into in a minute. And so these dotted lines here represent reads that span splice junctions. And so what we want to do is we want to map these reads to the reference genome to start to tell us where our reads came from. And so when you're talking about mapping, you're looking, trying to assess the genomic coordinates of where these reads came from, uh, which is great, but, but sometimes it's useful to get a bit more specific. Um, and so we also have alignment, which is basically like fine tuning mapping. And so this allows us to account for differences between our samples and the reference genome. And of course, this is gonna be important uh, because of things like what I just talked about where our reference genome is not gonna cover the diversity of, of each organism that we have. And so uh, doing an alignment will help account for some of those differences between the reference genome. So again, mapping here, you can see there's no base pair resolution, whereas in alignment, kind of zooming into this area, uh, we can now start to see in black here, we have our reference genome, and then uh, each one of these colors, the purple and the green, represent different reads that were derived, that we sequenced. And so as you can see, most of them map back pretty well to the reference. Um, however, we do see some differences from the reference genome in some of these. Uh, these are single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, um, and we can also see some, some gaps here. Uh, as well. And so using doing an alignment will kind of help us uh, identify those regions. Question from a couple questions. So Felix, were all the volunteers male? I have no idea, but uh, knowing the misogyny of this country, I am going to have to probably guess yes. Um, but that's just my bias as a female. So uh, I'm not 100% sure. I don't know. Lauren, do you know? I don't think, think that we know that information. Yeah, we, we don't actually know the, the, the sex or anything about the, the people who volunteered their samples, but. Uh, oh no, it has to be a mix. So I take back my statement um, because we also, of course, had to sequence the X chromosome as well as the Y chromosome and the reference genome does include both those chromosomes. So it was a mix of both males and females. Is there a specific reason we align to reference genome and not to reference transcriptome? Ooh, Diksha, good question. We can align to a reference transcriptome, absolutely. Um, if we are doing, if we have samples that were generated from ribodepletion, um, do you think that it would be better to align to a genome or a transcriptome? So it's kind of a, a trick question. Um, I don't know, you guys didn't find anything to answer. It, it depends on what the transcriptome entails. So I'll see some transcriptome builds that have like intronic regions uh, in addition to exons. Um, and also have, you know, some uh, untranslated regions and some might even have intergenic regions, but then there are also some transcriptome builds that just have exonic regions. And so, of course, if, if we're doing a ribodepletion, the reason that we're sequencing that is because we want to get more information than just our um, message RNA. And so 
we want to align back to a genome to make sure we're covering everything. But if we had a transcriptome that included all types of RNA, um, then, then we could uh, map to transcriptome. And if we are, if our library preparation was mRNA enrichment, so uh, selecting for that poly A tail to make sure we capture uh, mRNA, then uh, you absolutely could uh, could map to a transcriptome. And you kind of got ahead of me and answered some questions already. Felix, there's a Y chromosome that must be male. Yeah, so <laughs> so I took back took back my aggressive statement. <laughs> it's definitely a mix of males and females because um, we do have mapping of both the Y and the X chromosomes. Good questions, guys. Okay. Um, so in addition to doing alignments, when we align reads to the reference genomes, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be able to identify those uh, SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms. We're also going to be able to identify gaps, um, and we'll also identify insertions uh, in addition to the just the genomic coordinates of origin in that you would get from, from mapping. So let's talk about different, different ways to align different types of aligners. So we have global aligners, uh, and for each one of these aligners, I'm going to put in parentheses the algorithm that is used to um, perform the alignment. Uh, for those of you that uh, are interested in statistics, uh, like Felix, uh, you might be interested in, in the algorithms that were used. Uh, I would highly, highly suggest this is one of the things that I regret from back when I was in school is I took like one statistics course that was required for my math major probability and statistics, but but that was it. Um, that is like all the statistics training, uh, formal training I have in my background. And that is a huge disadvantage in the world of bioinformatics because a lot of what we do is um, dependent on different types of statistical analyses, how we come up with numbers and count data and do differential expression involves so much statistics. So Lauren's going to give you guys a nice overview of um, some of the statistics that she used in RNA sequencing data analysis. Um, but for those of you who are not seniors already, uh, who have not graduated, or for those seniors who are going on to do master's programs who haven't already graduated from master's program, I am going to highly, highly encourage you guys to take some stats classes. Um, biostatistics, if, if uh, San Jose State offers it, um, is going to be a good bet for you guys. So you will not regret it. And of everything to learn on your own, I mean, biology, you could learn a lot of that on your own and from the internet. Uh, coding, you could learn a lot of that on your own and from the internet. Statistics, however, I found from my personal experience and from talking to others, statistics is kind of tough uh, to learn on your own just from lectures just because a lot of times you kind of need that, that interaction, that communication with your instructor to understand things in the way that your brain works, which might not be how it's initially delivered. So um, highly recommend guys take, take more statistics courses. Okay, sorry for the digression, global aligners. So global aligners use this algorithm and they're gonna attempt to align the whole provided sequence end to end of both the query and the subject or target. So in RNA sequencing data, what we have, our query is going to be our insert or our read, and our subject or target is going to be our reference genome. But global aligners isn't really designed for that. So when you're thinking global aligners and you're aligning something end to end, um, obviously we wouldn't be able to align a short, tiny little read with a full on genome um, end to end. So this is mostly used for things like aligning two genomes of the same genus, for instance. So aligning two pseudomonad genomes. Um, to kind of compare and contrast differences. Or if you want to take a look at differences between like the mouse and the human transcriptome, you could do a global uh, aligner for something like that. So another type of aligner is called a local aligner. And again, this uses a, a, a different algorithm, the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And this attempts to find hits or chains of hits within each provided sequence. So uh, an example is identifying genes that share a domain within a target gene. So looking at a specific region of both your query and your target. And then we have glocal aligners. Um, so glocal aligners, uh, these were, were primarily used actually in kind of the initial short read aligners. So the initial types of aligners that were used to analyze RNA sequencing data. Um, but what they did is they assumed that the whole read came from one location within the reference or target sequence. So meaning that it's global with respect to the read, right? Because it covers the whole read, 
but local with respect to the reference genome. So only looking at a specific region of the reference genome. What would be the problem with assuming that a whole read came from one location within a reference sequence? It's particularly if that reference sequence is a genomic reference. Any guesses? Ignoring introns when looking at cDNA. Yes, Alicia, exactly. Um, so we know that when we have mature RNA, um, no, <laughs> are there any? <laughs> I should go with that. Yeah. So, uh, what if the whole read comes from multiple locations in the reference? Uh, again, Alicia, what you're getting at is reads that span splice junctions, um, meaning that if your reference genome contains both introns and exons, but when you generated your read, if you generated your read from a message RNA, of course, at the time of the mature message RNA, you have spliced out those introns, which means that if you have um, a read that comes from the end of exon one and the start of exon two, and you align that back to a reference genome, you're not gonna have any of that intronic sequence information there. And so your alignment is not gonna be able to accurately identify where it came from. And we're, we'll show some pictures and get into that a, a little more to, to, to kind of really nail that down. So nowadays, most aligners uh, used today are local with respect to both the read and the reference, and that allows them to ignore poor alignment in low quality reads uh, and low quality read ends and or adapter sequence. And so some would argue here um, because it's doing this locally with resp respect to both the read and the reference. Some people argue that um, you don't need to remove adapters anymore. I kind of disagree with that. I think it relies heavily on the on the alignment algorithm, but some people will say that, that you don't need to. And so just a little pictorial question. How local is local? Can local be a whole chromosome? Yeah, for sure. If you're, um, of course, you would want to, if you're doing a, a local to local, um, you would want them to be roughly the, the same size, right? Comparing that local region to that local region. But yeah, for sure. Uh, local can be any specific region uh, of an entire thing. And so uh, just taking a look at what this looks like pictorially. So this is what global alignment would be. It basically would be an end-to-end -end alignment of, um, in this case, let's say this is our query and this is our reference. Um, so we're kind of aligning these from end-to-end -end and trying to see where we get the most matches in that alignment. And again, that uses the needle, uh, the needleman launch algorithm. I probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, and then local alignment depicted here is looking specifically at one region of your query and one region uh, of your target. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit more about reads that span splice sites. So a little bit about what uh, I was describing verbally and what Alicia mentioned in the chat. Is so just to kind of give you a pictorial representation of what I was saying. So we had, let's say we have an M mRNA in our sample, right? Um, which is very reasonable. Um, so we have this mRNA, and that's part of what we pulled out when we isolated our total RNA. And then uh, during the library preparation process, as we know, we kind of chopped this up, right? Um, but keeping in mind that this mRNA was actually uh, derived originally from a DNA sequence here that we see up here, um, and that DNA sequence was transcribed to give pre-mRNA, which you see here. So that pre-mRNA has a mix of both exons as um, we see indicated in green, as well as introns, as we see indicated in this orangish color. And of course we have our five prime, three prime untranslated reasons, our five prime cap and our poly A tail. And then that pre mRNA is um, matured and we have RNA splicing that happens during that maturation process to remove those introns, giving us our message RNA, right? Um, so just a reminder of where this ultimate uh, mRNA transcript came from. And so when we went ahead and isolated it and then chopped it up in our library preparation step, um, we created these inserts that we then sequenced, right? So when we sequenced this region here, well, that region spanned a splice site. And so now what happens is when we go to align this read back to our reference genome, 
Now we have this issue if we're, we don't have an aligner that knows about splice sites or a spliced aware aligner is what it's called. Um, it will have no idea where this read came from because some of the sequence maps to here and some of the sequence maps to here, but absolutely none of this um, intronic region is represented in the read that we're trying to determine where it came from. Um, so this is, of course, a problem. So if we align reads back to the reference DNA, how do we know where an mRNA-derived read came from when it spans a splice site? The answer to this is splice-aware aligners. So this is getting into the differences, again, between uh, these two different types of short-read aligners, splice-unaware and spliced-aware. Um, so again, it's just showing you another picture of what you just saw. So you have this mRNA. We have our read uh, of where this read was derived from. And so we have our read, not knowing where it came from, trying to figure it out. And so we're mapping that read back to a reference genome. And because it spans a splice site, if our aligner is not aware that splice sites exist, it won't be able to accurately map this read. So splice unaware aligners are going to be unable to properly align reads that span splice junction. And thus, those are more commonly used for DNA-DNA alignment. Um, and so this kind of gets to, to Dikshas' question of could these be used for aligning RNA-seq data? You guys can write your answers in the chat. And if you say yes, tell me, tell me how. In what context could they be used? If it's easier, you guys can also unmute your mics. Is it possible to use a splice unaware aligner to align RNA sequencing data? Yes, no, no, yes. We talked about this a little bit. If you have the translation of the DNA and the RNA seq data, perhaps. Yeah, Eowyn, uh, that's that's close for sure. Um, so translation, of course, is protein. Um, so that would be amino acid sequence, and we're at the transcription level. So we're looking for uh, an RNA sequence. And so, but you're you're on the right track. Um, so if we are aligning, if we are aligning back to a transcriptome, and if our reads were all derived from mRNA, then we should be able to use a splice unaware aligner. Uh, with with one limitation, what do you think that limitation could be? What would be a limitation of aligning reads that came from message RNA to a transcriptome? So Hannah Lee says, has to be known genes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when you're aligning back to a transcriptome, that's going to be uh, known genes that you're aligning to. But remember, uh, genes can come in, in the same gene can come in a few different flavors. So if we go back, let me use my mouse. Okay. So if we go back here, we have um, just taking a look at this mRNA. So this mRNA came from splicing together of these, of its three exons, could you also have another mRNA derived from the same pre-mRNA that looks different than this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hannah Lee said exon one and exon three only, exactly. So you can have splice isoforms of a gene, right? So unless your transcriptome that you're mapping to has all possible splice isoforms, um, you, would, you would be limited in being able to detect, accurately detect splice isoforms um, for reads that uh, look at the different splicing regions. And we're actually going to get into that with some, with some pictures again uh, in a little bit. So we have these splice unaware aligners, which are primarily used for DNA-DNA alignment. But as we just mentioned, they could be used for aligning RNA-seq data, um, so long as you're mapping 
RNA-seq data derived from message RNA or poly A selection. Um, with the caveat of that you have to align it back to a transcriptome and that transcriptome, if you want isoform uh, information, would have to contain isoforms. And so uh, how another a way that this splice unaware aligners are used in RNA sequencing, um, one type of them, I guess I should say, is called pseudo aligners. Um, and so pseudo aligners are a type of spliced unaware aligners. And they compare read K-mers. So MER is another way to say base. Um, and K is just represents a number. Um, so it compares uh, read K-mers overlapping subsequences to a transcriptome, what's, what's known as, uh, I'm going to kill this pronunciation. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? De Bruin graph? Huh? I've heard, uh, I, as I've heard from an instructor, uh, De Bruin. De Bruin. Maybe. But again, maybe they were mispronouncing it. <laughs> um, Jonathan's right. It's Dutch, which means you have to kind of gargle while you're saying it. But De Bruyne or De Bruyne is about as close as anybody from around here can get. <laughs> De Graaf. That's Gavin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Heller and Jonathan. Um, yeah, so this is this is a type of graph. Um, it's, it's actually kind of pretty cool. It looks at patterns. So it'll take your reference transcriptome and it'll kind of make a map, uh, this uh, De Bruyne uh, graph or map of your transcriptome um, based on the complexity. So it looks for patterns uh, within your transcriptome and kind of breaks it based on a certain number of k-mers and you could tell it how many k-mers to do it. And pseudo aligners will have default amounts of k-mers that it breaks it down into. So again, k-mers is just the length, the number of bases. Um, that it uses, and then it looks for different combinations of that same number of bases uh, to kind of get an idea of the complexity of your transcriptome and the different transcripts within your transcriptome. And then it uses that, that De Bruyne graph, that patterned information of your transcriptome, and then it assesses the patterns that are represented in your reads. And based on the complexity of the pattern in your reads and how that matches to the complexity of the different transcripts, based on these KMER patterns, it'll then be able to tell where, which transcript those reads came from. Um, so it's actually, it's pretty cool. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it just because we don't use it, um, but it's pretty cool. And I'll give you some links to some of these pseudo aligners. So if you guys are interested in this type of, of mapping, you can kind of take a look. But the caveat, of course, because it's kind of just looking at the complexity of these, of the sequences relative to the transcriptome that it's being mapped to, um, it, it isn't considered an aligner. So this is definitely a mapper. It doesn't actually like align things and see where the A's and the T's and the G's line up. Um, so this is considered, considered a mapper. And it's actually pretty good. Uh, and one huge benefit to this is that it's super fast and it doesn't require a lot of computational resources. So splice aware aligners require a lot of computational resources. So if you don't have that much, uh, computational resources, you could still do this kind of mapping. And so basically what it'll generate as opposed to like alignments of your reads, it'll just give you your count data right off the bat. And just one of the, the drawbacks of doing it this way is that it tends to have a uh, poor performance and being able to quantify uh, lowly abundant and small RNAs. So basically the transcripts that aren't barely, that aren't highly expressed and also RNAs that are small in size, um, so you don't have enough information about the, the complexity there, it has a hard time quantifying those. But if you're not very interested in low abundant uh, transcripts or in small RNAs when you're doing your stuff, um, this is a great alternative to uh, splice aware aligners uh, if you have limited resources. So moving on to splice aware aligners. So splice aware aligners uses that Smith Waterman algorithm that uh, you saw with the local uh, alignment in the previous slide, I guess two slides ago. And splice aware aligners are equipped to handle intron size gaps. And so basically um, they're able to handle, they know about these, these gaps here. And so that allows us to approve, improve the alignment of reads that span those splice junctions when it's aligning to a reference genome. And that's why these are commonly used for transcript-derived cDNA to DNA alignment, which is what we're, what we're using and what we're going to be doing. 
So uh, again, as I promised, uh, some examples of splice unaware aligners. Our BWA is actually a very um, commonly used one for assessing DNA sequence, sequences. Bowtie is another uh, popular one, which is pretty similar to BWA. And if you guys want to read more about those, I gave, I gave you guys the links. Uh, pseudo aligners, the most popular ones that, that I know about are Callisto and Salmon. Uh, and those are the ones that do that KMER mapping uh, type algorithm. And you can learn more about how that's set up. Um, for those of you guys that are more statistically minded, um, really cool technology and how they do it. It, it took me a few times to um, be able to fully grasp how they were doing stuff. Um, so go ahead and take a look at their website and they kind of get into detail. And there's some cool resources they provide to tell you exactly how they're setting up these, uh, this De Bruyne graph uh, when they're doing the analysis. And then uh, the ones that we're going to focus on from here on out are splice aware aligners, um, specifically spliced transcripts aligned to a reference or star. Um, star is the aligner that we use in our gene lab pipeline to align our data. And I also have another splice aware aligner here. Um, it's another one that's pretty commonly used. It's called hierarchical indexing for spliced alignment of transcripts two or HiSAT two. So it's the second version of this tool. And uh, I have links to, to all of these if you guys wanna, wanna read more about it. Um, oh, and I should mention, this by no mean covers the amount of tools that are available to do alignment. So again, this is why we have these conversations with our analysis working group members, because for every single step of this pipeline, there are tons of tools available to be able to um, process your data and different tools will give you different results. There's also a ton uh, of different papers that are comparing these different tools. And so we kind of looked into the literature to see, you know, which tools are the best, um, depending on different tissue types, because of course we have a bunch of different organisms. Um, yeah, Mary just said another uh, example of how to pronounce De Bruyne. De Bruyne. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so yeah, we, we basically did our research and our due diligence, uh, looked into the literature for these papers that kind of compared these different types of aligners for different types of tissues for mRNA versus ribodepleted derived uh, RNA. And so, um, and also had, this is, this is probably our, one of our biggest debates with our uh, analysis working group members for what aligner to use, but definitely not the biggest. The biggest was our quantitation for sure. Um, and STAR, STAR is a really good one. So continuously, if you look at any of those references, uh, and I'll put some in the, the Google Drive if you're interested, but STAR continuously uh, performs pretty well in kind of the, the mix of contexts of tissue types and types of, of RNA. And so because we wanted to use the same pipeline for all the organisms that we have on GeneLab, um, we decided to go with STAR. Okay, um, I keep talking about this reference genome. So uh, let's, let's look at it a little bit more in depthly. So short read aligners, uh, of course, require a reference when aligning RNA sequencing data. We use the reference genome of the organism in which the samples were derived. So for our case, when analyzing GLDS-104, that came from, as I mentioned, the Rodent Research 1 mission. So these were mice um, that we took out the soleus muscle of and then isolated RNA from that soleus muscle. So when we want to align our reads back to a reference, we will be using the mouse reference genome. So reference genomes are stored in a file type called FASTA files. And that file format looks like this. And so I'll kind of break down the different sections of this. So we have this area here, pretty obvious, that's the sequence. Um, we have an, within these sequences, sometimes you'll see like a strand of ends. And that usually represents a gap in the assembly, so a region of the genome that we're just not sure about. And sometimes you'll see kind of these low, spans of lowercase uh, letters within the genome as opposed to capital letters. And that usually indicates that maybe that region, there's lower confidence in the assembly, or that could just be a region of the genome that's super highly repetitive that we might want to uh, mask when we're going to do our alignments back to the reference because it's, it's uninteresting. Uh, and so all of the FASTA files will start with this caret here, as shown right here. Uh, that'll indicate the header for the reference sequence. And then next you'll see an identifier 
uh, for the reference sequence. And this is specific to the database that you pull your reference from. And so uh, for us right here, this is a chromosome number. Not, this is chromosome seven. It could also be a gene symbol. Uh, again, it depends on the database that you're pulling from and what FASTA file you're grabbing. And so for us, this is a FASTA file from the mouse genome, and this is uh, chromosome seven. And this is just the number seven that's actually specific to ensemble notation. So ensemble is the database that we pull our reference from. If you get it from a different database, there might be like CHR in front of this seven um, or some other way to indicate the chromosome. Uh, so next, after the identifier in this header line, what you're gonna find is description fields. And so again, kind of similar to how that, that uh, sequence ID, that identifier is shown, uh, the description field, the number of the description fields and what's contained within the description fields and how those description fields are set up is gonna be specific to the database that you get this FASTA file from. And these description fields will tell you some additional information about the sequence. Um, so here we're told that this is DNA, it's from a chromosome. Um, this is the build of the, the mouse assembly, uh, the GRCM38, uh, and then some information about the location of where we're finding this one. So this tells me chromosome seven, uh, start position one of chromosome seven, and this is the end position. So I obviously cut this sequence off. Um, this is a lot longer than what's being shown here. Um, and let's see, description two, uh, for this one, it just says that this is a reference, so a reference database. And again, these descriptions, the description fields, even how they're separated. So you'll notice here on um, these description fields, this is actually has three. So I need to fix this because this is one description field and it's separated by spaces. We have our identifier, a space, this description one field, and then a space. This is actually a description two field, and then a space is, is technically a description three field. And so you'll notice in uh, Ensemble, this read header is separated by spaces. In some databases, you might see a pipe separating the different description fields. In other databases, you could see a comma. So it's really dependent on where you get it from. In addition to our sequence file, our FASTA, um, that has our reference sequence, we also need to know information about that sequence, right? So just knowing the chromosome isn't gonna be enough when we're trying to figure out which genes are being expressed in our data. And so what we also want is a gene annotation file. Um, so again, if we wanna identify annotated genes, which are genes with known genomic coordinates and often also functions, uh, we need to provide the aligner with a gene annotation file corresponding to the reference genome used. So again, for our case, it's gonna be mouse. And these gene annotations are gonna be stored in gene feature format or gene transfer format files. Uh, and that format is gonna look like this. Uh, this is a GTF file uh, that I'm showing you. And uh, there's different versions of the gene feature format file. Um, and gene feature format two is, uh, I believe, the same information that's contained in the GTF files. They're now on to gene feature file three, uh, which contains uh, more uh, explicit information. We could talk about it if you guys are interested. Let's go over kind of the, the different categories of this gene transfer format file, GTF file. So I'm gonna go through column by column. Um, to let you guys know the information that's embedded in here. And I have a little asterisk next to the um, line item or the gene feature that I'm going to use as an example in brackets here for each one of the columns. So in the first column, what you're going to have is the sequence name. Um, so name of the chromosome or the scaffold that you're using. So for us, we have a number three here in I know this is ensemble, and so that number three means chromosome three. Number two, column two, is gonna be the source uh, or the program that generated the GTF file. Um, so I should point out, wherever you're getting your annotations from, that has to be the same, uh, associated with the same genome build that your FASTA file came from, and the same release of that genome build. And so, they have these genome builds that are released and publicly available, and then they're improved upon, uh, usually a few times a year. 
Uh, and so there's different releases of the same build. And in those different releases, you might have more information about maybe some of those assembly gaps were filled in or maybe some of those uh, low confidence regions became higher confidence um, with more information. And then anytime there's like a major change or a major update, you have a different genome build. And then again, you have subsequent uh, releases. And so you wanna make sure that your fast A file and your respective annotation file uh, were both derived from the same genome build and the same release of that genome build. And you guys have questions about that, we can, we can talk more about it. Okay, so the second column in the GTF file will tell you the program that generated the GTF file or the, the specific feature. Um, so for us, we see it says Ensemble Havana. So this is another way to, to know that it's an Ensemble file. And actually, uh, Havana is uh, something, a database that came before Ensemble, from my understanding, and Ensemble kind of ingested uh, that information. The third column, what you're going to see is the feature type. So this can be a gene, an exon, a CDS region, a start codon, et cetera. So what we see in this example is uh, we have a CDS uh, region there, or feature. Uh, column number four is going to be the start location on the reference sequence. Um, so the reference sequence is, of course, uh, here in column one. So this is on chromosome three. So with respect to chromosome three, this particular CDS feature is going to start at this base pair location on, the, on chromosome three. And column five is going to say the location on, on chromosome three in our example of where this specific feature ends. Column six is just a floating point value. Not really sure what that's used for. Um, column seven is going to indicate if it's a forward or reverse strand. Um, so for us, we see that this feature is derived from the reverse strand of the reference or the antisense strand. Column eight is going to indicate which base, zero, one, or two, is the first base of a codon. Does everybody know what a codon is? If you know what a codon is, unmute your mic and tell me, or write in the chat. A triplet of bases that correspond to an amino acid. Absolutely, Hanalee. Yes. Um, so a codon is a three base code that's embedded within our RNA strand that encodes for a protein. So of course, not all um, not all regions of uh, our reads, not all regions of RNA um, are going to encode for proteins. But the regions that do encode for proteins, those protein codes are represented by three-letter codons uh, on the RNA level. And so basically, uh, CDS means that this is a coding region. And so for the coding regions, it'll tell us if uh, this particular feature starts at um, the beginning of a codon, so the beginning of those three bases, which it's, it's indicated by the zeroth position of the codon or the second of the three, which is the one position, since this is a, a zero based, or that third location of the codon, which is, um, is a, a two location, um, because again, it's zero based. So it'll tell us where within that three letter code um, that this feature starts. Column number nine is going to be uh, the attribute column. And so this is going to be a semicolon de delimited list of tags that have additional information. And I actually cut this off, so there's quite a bit more information in this last column here. Um, and so again, the amount of information that's here for each feature is gonna be dependent on the uh, database that you pulled this from. And that covers all of the gene annotation columns. Uh, so where do we get these from? I kind of keep alluding to Ensemble, which is where we get ours from. So reference genomes and respective annotation files can be downloaded from publicly available databases. There's a lot of them. So Ensemble is one that we use at GeneLab. Um, there's also Ensemble Genomes. And uh, so Ensemble is used for 
animals and some genomes. You can find uh, plant uh, genomic builds there. And then I think there's another one for microbes too, a different one. And then we have GenCode, which is another database, which actually uses Ensemble IDs. Uh, you can get them from Illumina iGenomes. And those are the ones that if you guys use any of the, like the built-in software from Illumina, uh, the, um, they use their internal uh, genomes for the references. Question, is there a reason they don't use 123 rather than 012? Uh, I don't know why that is, why they start, why the convention is to do 012. Does anybody else know? I don't know the history of that selection for that convention of 012. And you know, I think I asked that back when I was um, in school many moons ago, um, but I don't remember the answer that I got. <laughs> Jonathan guess programmers prefer it. It's not all about the programmers, Jonathan. Codons were discovered by biologists. They probably just wanted to make our lives difficult. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Uh, Felix, you wanted me to explain this last column, so column nine. Um, so, so this is just a bunch of additional information about this feature. And so um, in this one in particular, so in, in this, uh, again, the amount of information in this kind of last column, each different piece of information is separated by a semicolon and the amount of information here. So I actually cut this off. There's more information here than, what, than what's shown. Um, it's going to be dependent on the database that it came from. And so, as you see here, this is saying that um, it's going to use this gene ID. So this feature came from the this ensemble gene ID. So this code right here. Oops. Um, so this ENSMUSG is the ensemble notation for a mouse gene. Um, and so this is derived from mouse gene one. Well, zero, a whole bunch of zeros in a one. Um, it tells you information about the version of the assembly of that gene. So this is from version four. Um, it tells you information about the transcript ID from where this feature was derived from. And then it could have other information too. Does that answer your question? DNA. We could take a look at, at the GTF file. Um, oh, yes. Sorry. I guess my thumbs up wasn't coming through. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, I can't see yeah, everyone. Maybe I can up here um, when I just been paying attention. Uh, yeah. So, uh, again, it contains a variety of information. Uh, it's dependent on the assembly. And actually, um, when we're going through and pulling information, so as we add columns, uh, annotation columns to our final differential expression table, uh, which you guys are going to be doing with Lauren uh, later in the week, probably on Friday, uh, you're going to be pulling kind of the information from these GTF files to add in this information to our, um, our final table that we provide to our users. Okay, so we're referencing, so Illumina I genomes, where you ended up at. There's also NCBI genomes. Um, so probably the most common uh, ones that, that I've heard of from other bioinformaticians. A lot of bioinformaticians will use Ensemble, which is one of the reasons we chose that. Um, but also another really popular one is NCBI. GenCode's another popular one, but it uses Ensemble IDs anyways. Um, so kind of like a debate that we had in the analysis working group is uh, some people really wanted Ensemble, other people were kind of harping on NCBI, and it's the people in the micro world that really wanted the NCBI. Um, is there a specific reason why I prefer Ensemble? Um, me specifically, so considering that I'm still pretty new to bioinformatics, um, Ensemble, I took actually a boot camp similar to the one that I'm giving right now. Um, Gene let me go to one at UC Davis and they used Ensemble. And uh, they're, they're, they keep their builds uh, pretty up to date. They have regular releases and I really like, uh, they provide a lot of information about how to, or about what changed from version to version in their releases. And uh, they use an FTP, I can't remember what that stands for, but it makes it really easy to download the files. And the files are always in a consistent location. Um, 
making it really easy to pull the files. So I really like because it's well, it's well annotated. They keep track of all their versionings and stuff very nicely. They archive old versions, so you can usually get to them pretty easily. Um, it's easy to pull these files. Their FTP always uses the same path. Um, so again, easy to find. They don't really move things around too much um, or ever really. So um, kind of the path to the file is the path that they maintain. So I just, I really like their setup. I really like how they do things. They consistently update their um, their builds. They provide a lot of information for that. And some of these other ones do too, but just not as much, I think, personally, as Ensemble does. Uh, NCVI, it's it's a good one, but it could be a little clunky too and c- could be a little confusing on, on where you pull uh, the genome builds from. And there's like a few different places that you can get the same information from, which makes things a little confusing sometimes. So just in my experience, Ensemble has just always been very smooth um, to access information that I want to get. So that's why I was leaning towards that. Um, one limitation is that um, it, some of these tools, when it's aligning for like microbes, so uh, prokaryotes, um, some of the tools are expecting prokaryotic references to come from NCBI. Uh, and Ensemble sometimes isn't great uh, or doesn't have a lot of builds for uh, prokaryotic organisms. So that's the one limitation of Ensemble and why some of the uh, the micro people were like, no, we should use NCBI. But Ensemble has consistent mapping from gene level to isoform, splice grant level information, which, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Lauren, for pointing that out. Yeah, so, so I really like Ensemble. Um, we have different reasons for using different things. This wasn't too big of a debate, so most people were pretty happy with, with Ensemble. Uh, in addition to these databases, uh, League Explains GTF Brain. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Marie. Uh, Marie just provided a link that gets into a little bit about the, the frame numbering of 012. Um, <laughs> that has to do with math. Thanks, Marie. Uh, and so some specialized databases uh, is also where you can get genomes. So again, sometimes the, these uh, primary places can be limited in the genome and genome assembly. So there are specialized databases as well. So fruit fly researchers will probably get their genomes from fly base. There's also worm base, for people that use worms. There's Zen base, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I did my postdoc using Xenopus. Um, so I really like Zen base. Uh, there's vector base. Uh, there's also photozyme base for plant stuff. Um, so there's all sorts of different specialized databases you can get genomes from, but we, we always get it from Ensemble. Um, so once we have our FASTA file and our respective genome file, our next step is to build a STAR index. Um, and actually, we have about one minute till the break. Um, so I, I think I want to stop here. Uh, so that way I can be respectful of our break time. But in this last minute, is there anyone that has any lingering questions about anything I went over so far? No? Okay. Um, so in that case, I'll send you guys on your break uh, about uh, um, 30 seconds early, and then just make sure that you're back here by 3.20.